Good afternoon and uh, welcome to this uh, fourth day of the Stockholm uh, Forum. Uh, you have joined the session on COVID-19 and United Nations peace operations. My name is Cedric de Kooning. I'm a senior research fellow with the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs. And I'm also the coordinator of the Effectiveness of Peace Operations Network. Uh, both NUPI and, and EARPON, the network, are the co-hosts for this session today. I'm also an, an advisor with ACCORD, an African uh, conflict resolution NGO. Um, you have joined us uh, this afternoon to focus together with us on a discussion on how COVID-19 has affected United Nations peace operations and how United Nations peace operations are helping the countries where they are deployed to cope and manage with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. We have an excellent panel uh, that's going to address this topic. Uh, let me introduce the panel briefly and then we will, we will of course, uh, have more time with each of the different panelists. First of all, let me introduce uh, uh, Mohammed Ibn Chambers. He is from Ghana. He is the Special Representative of the Secretary General and Head of the United Nations Office for West Africa and the Sahel. And then we have uh, uh, Madame Leila Zarugi, who is uh, from Algeria, and she is the Special Representative of the Secretary General and Head of the United Nations Stabilization Mission in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, the mission that goes by the acronym of MONUSCO. Uh, we also have Lieutenant General Dennis Gillespur from the Swedish Armed Forces, who is the Force Commander of the United Nations Multidimensional Integrated Stabilization Mission in Mali, or MINUSMA. And we are also joined by uh, Rania Dagash Kamara, who is the Chief of Policy and Best Practices in the Department of Peace Operations in New York. Um, and we have uh, Dr. Lise Mario Howard, who is the Professor of Government at Georgetown University uh, and one of the, the leading authorities on, on peace operations. And she's recently published a book, Power and Peacekeeping, that we'll also touch upon just now when we um, have a chance to discuss some of these issues together. Before we start, let me just uh, emphasize a couple of, of technical issues. We're all getting used to these webinars that we are all part of these days. Just to remind you that uh, in this particular uh, format, uh, we will only have the panelists that will be able to speak, but uh, the members of the audience or those of you who are participating uh, as part of the, the call, you are able to send in questions via the chat function and please do so. We will post some of those to the panelists later. We also have a number of people who are on a live stream. Uh, and if there are some of you that are having trouble with the bandwidth when you are on the call, perhaps try the live stream. That's a good alternative option. You can just go to the, the CIPRI channel on YouTube and follow this discussion as well. We will also have two polls that uh, during the course of the session, we'll ask you a polling question that those of you that are on the uh, connected to this call um, can answer and then we will show the results as well. And that's another way that we can track a little bit some of your perceptions and feedback on the discussions in the seminar. So let me go to our first question. And I would ask to ask, I would like to ask uh, Laila Zarugi to tell us a little bit more about how the mission in the Congo have been managing the COVID-19 crisis. We know that uh, although the COVID-19 crisis is something new and something that you have to deal with, uh, of course, your mandate has not changed and the situation in the Congo has probably not changed much, but uh, you are now forced to to manage the situation with uh, a lot of constraints perhaps imposed to you by the uh, measures introduced to contain the COVID-19 crisis. And it would be very interesting to hear uh, what kind of considerations you have used internally to try and identify what is the essential parts of your mission and how, that, how these uh, uh, steps that you have taken have perhaps affected your operation as a result. Leila. 
Uh, Leila, we can't hear you, so maybe you are muted. Let's just see if we can put your thank microphone you very on. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for uh, this very uh, uh, really relevant uh, discussion on our uh, the challenge that we are facing. I would like to start by saying it's really unfortunate that for DRC, the time that we had with the opening of the new government, with the very strong relationship that we build with the new government to really not only work on uh, uh, the issue of peace, uh, stability, uh, of uh, uh, protection of civilian and dealing with the very uh, 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 challenging uh, situation in the East, but also an opening to work on stabilization, the uh, the the um, uh, uh, drawdown of the mission, uh, all this. Of, of course, was impacted deeply by the crisis because, as you are aware, the, the, the COVID-19 impacted the, uh, the epicenter was in Kinshasa, uh, the, the limit of the movement, the fact that the government uh, don't have uh, enough capacity, resources, and to focus on many issues at the same time. So uh, the challenge that they were facing uh, put a lot of uh, uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, difficulties for us to address so many issues at the same time to work on the transition to build uh, uh, for the next mandate etc but from the beginning because we were we are aware that we cannot afford to say let us wait until things will be fixed because a peacekeeping is deployed in a difficult context in a challenging context and we cannot say that we are uh, COVID us from working. So our first priority was to say, we have to stay, we have to deliver while taking the necessary measures to protect our people, to not be ourselves seen as vector of spreading the disease. So many of the, the measures that we started with is first to stop uh, the rotation of troops to stop uh, returning of staff from outside until we prepare ourselves to have the isolation uh, 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 place for the, the, the quarantine and to make sure that uh, our AHEA can deliver without creating threat for them from inside. So that was the first thing. The second thing that we, we uh, were uh, uh, really uh, uh, lucky because the the the, um, the government is uh, uh, focusing on Kinshasa, Kinshasa, the epicenter, is to continue our delivery in the East when it comes to protection of civilian. Our movement we negotiated to make sure that we will not be blocked because also governors took uh, action to stop uh, the movement from Kinshasa. So uh, we decided that we have to really ensure that the protection of civilians stay as a priority we identify what we can do and how we can deliver on without putting our people uh, uh, at risk and without, of course, stopping our own. The major challenge that we are facing is because of the uh, focus of the government on the economy, on the shift, on focus on mitigating uh, measures concerning you know, the, the, the risk for this country is also that they will have lack support from outside. They will have a very the big impact on the economy, uh, informal economy, economy that should continue to sustain uh, in a context where people you cannot uh, shut down people that have to go out every day to have their food. So a lot of challenges that the government is trying to find here. And of course, uh, armed groups seize the opportunity to uh, start building up their uh, 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 attacks on civilian. And of course, you in this kind of context with the Congo, that's so challenging with the new dynamics and a lot of tension between uh, inside uh, coalition, between coalition and, uh, and uh, opposition. So a lot of challenge they have to face while focusing on this threat, ourselves, we decided that we have to provide the support even in, uh, for their work on to deal with the, 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 the COVID. For example, we decided to open a, a course 
for children in using our uh, uh, um, our OKP radio, working with the Minister of Health uh, of uh, Education, working with uh, UNICEF to help uh, uh, in this, and I think it was very much appreciated. We are also working with them to build our own uh, uh, medical capacity to not become ourselves a burden on the very limited medical capacity that exists on the country. So we decided that we build our own capacity to deal at least with our own people if we have sick. We really worked very hard to not have uh, uh, cases uh, uh, in the mission. We have now one case uh, that was a person was in, in, infected in, in her house with her family and we are dealing with the consequences to ensure that this will not spread. So things that we are doing at the same time, also helping our own people to feel that because our capacity is also to send a message to our staff that if something happened, we will take care of you. We will be able to support you. Uh, and so um, uh, this is there, but we decided to be here. We decided to continue to work because we cannot afford as a mission, peacekeeping mission, to say, oh, there is a problem, I will go out, we will wait until things are fixed and I will come back. We have to show our relevance, we have to continue to seize opportunities to work on uh, when we have the space to ensure that our relevance is there and to keep the government focused on issues that may be uh, because of the ever well overwhelming situation, they will forget about it. Uh, so that's what we are trying to do. That's what we'd like to, to achieve. And we will continue to do that. And I'm very pleased that I have a very strong team that continue to support, continue to go out. Our military are going out daily, uh, 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 supporting the FRDC. Uh, uh, we are performing uh, medevac for, for the injured because we have operation ongoing in many areas in the country. We have armed groups that are trying to build up uh, uh, the, the reasons for them to exist, to continue to influence, to create this, uh, this tension between community. We are also supporting peace process who were signed before the COVID and we would like to keep it alive. So that's, I think, what I would like to to share with you. And I'm happy if you need more questions, if, if there is more question for me. Thank you very much, Leila. And I would like to, to go next to uh, Lieutenant General Dennis Gillespoor and and ask him uh, in the context in Mali and their mission, uh, you know, how the situation has affected their mission and what steps they have taken in that context to adjust to the realities of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much. And also thank you very much for the opportunity to partake in, in this uh, very timely conference. Uh, well, uh, in short, we have taken uh, three principal uh, decisions uh, to pursue uh, this challenge. And the first decision uh, that uh, SRC took uh, was not uh, what to do, but how. And uh, uh, mindful that uh, uh, the, the situation in Mali uh, was developing uh, slower in terms of, of uh, having people contracted uh, COVID, but uh, the government was very proactive in it. Uh, earlier, before, uh, even before the pandemic uh, was declared, uh, the government uh, put forward a number of measures. And the decision by the SRSG was to build a strategic partnership, uh, including uh, with the government, but also other actors in country. And uh, uh, we did that in, in a number of ways. Uh, to build trust, we were very transparent from the mission. Uh, we had a few uh, suspected cases very early on, uh, which turned out not to be uh, COVID cases, but uh, that opened up also uh, for a very trustful relationship between the government and the mission. And uh, more importantly, he assigned one of the deputy SRSGs as the point of contact, as the interlocutor between the mission and uh, uh, the various ministries involved. And this has uh, uh, evolved uh, since the beginning and been uh, a very, very important uh, uh, vehicle for our cooperation. And of course, 
uh, the other UN agencies have been uh, brought in under this umbrella also working together. And we have had some cases also where we reach out to embassies. So the, the, the first step was to establish a strategic partnership with all the actors uh, in the uh, in country that uh, we have uh, uh, reason to, to cooperate with. The second step uh, was quite uh, straightforward because, uh, again, the government was proactive, uh, they were leaning forward, uh, and they also articulated a number of priorities uh, on their behalf. And uh, more specifically, they decided to continue to pursue the legislative elections, despite uh, the COVID situation. And so for us, it became a given to support, to set conditions, to facilitate uh, more than planned. And, and uh, we provided uh, additional support to make this very important uh, step of the peace process uh, to continue on. Uh, and there were some other uh, also activities that, that they wanted to continue on with, and we stayed on the course and obviously, uh, there were some some activities that the government chose not to, to conduct. And uh, from that perspective, it became self-evident that uh, there was no support needed. Uh, so uh, moving on to the uh, uh, doing uh, uh, a lot of the changes in the mission in terms of priorities beyond the really strategic points, uh, uh, we set up a task force, again, headed by the deputy SRSG that uh, uh, provided the linkage with, with the other actors, with the government, and uh, a number of uh, cross-cutting working groups. Uh, and one of those working groups, just to one, mention one of them, uh, uh, was uh, on uh, the impact on the mandate. Uh, so this is a regular uh, review of the mandate and the mandate implication. And uh, underpinning uh, these assessments uh, is a strategic contingency plan. We've looked at different scenarios uh, following what we've seen in other countries in terms of the number of, of uh, cases that we can anticipate. And also mindful of the capacity of the country and the, and the anticipated need for support from the Malian side. Uh, so that gave us a very good uh, uh, situational understanding. Uh, and then when we look at the decisions and the priorities, I think there are three factors that have shaped our decision-making. Uh, first of all, there is a set of limiting factors. Uh, and those include uh, some of the logistical constraints that we have uh, seen uh, and experienced. We have uh, uh, specific guidance from the UN, uh, for the UN headquarters uh, regarding rotations of units and, and individuals. Uh, and also, obviously, uh, a number of decisions made by the government that also uh, <clears throat> apply on us uh, uh, in the mission. And the other, uh, the other category would be uh, what I call credibility uh, activities or credibility measures. And for us, it's not uh, it's uh, necessary but not sufficient just to follow follow the, the rules and regulations. We have to we have to do more uh, because. Uh, at, at stake here is the credibility of the UN, the reputational risk. So we had very early on to show that we, we are, we're doing more than necessary or more than the requirements. So uh, we put uh, more uh, measures in place uh, based on, on the government guidance and had stronger measures in terms of quarantine and uh, putting in place uh, guidance for uh, no direct interaction with the population, uh, terminating CIMIC activities, uh, making sure that we distribute the personnel in different headquarters, reallocating a programmatic funding to support the Malian efforts, and so on. So we, we took some uh, very proactive measures uh, in, in that regard to safeguard uh, our credibility. And the, and the third category, obviously, is the mandate itself. And for, for MINUSMA, uh, the core of the mandate uh, is uh, uh, consisting of two strategic priorities to continue on to support the implementation implementation of the peace accord and also to to safeguard and, and support the protection of civilians activities in the center of the country so what we did uh, we came back to those basic priorities and trying to to limit uh, the scope uh, and and uh, the activities that did not have a direct bearing uh, on on these uh, uh, core 
tasks. So these are the steps that we've gone through. And, and just uh, to address your your uh, your other point here, uh, to what extent the, the mission has changed. Uh, uh, first of all, I think uh, MINUSMA has become more cohesive. Uh, it has brought us together because obviously this cuts across all the pillars in the mission. Uh, and uh, also the fact that we have the mission leadership uh, in place now for a number of months uh, without any R&R and &R leave also uh, creates a, a very much more cohesive leadership uh, uh, here in Bamako. Uh, we become more focused, uh, uh, reviewing and, and questioning what we're doing and uh, making sure that everything is uh, directly linked to these strategic priorities of the mandate. And uh, I also think we've come together uh, in another sense in the mission uh, uh, because we have uh, now uh, stepped forward in terms of the internal communication. We have uh, articulating the SRSG is, is addressing uh, the personnel uh, numerous times and we, we continue to, to learn and adapt to use uh, video conferences and uh, benefiting from, from the, the potential that it has. Uh, obviously, this has some uh, detrimental impacts also. Uh, we have uh, lowered the level of activities in, in, uh, in uh, some of the regions, in particular when it comes to the civilian uh, part, because uh, some of the super camps have been uh, or, and still are on lockdown. So uh, while we can conduct security operations, some of the activities uh, that were planned and obviously also uh, uh, prioritized, on, we are not able to do them for, for those reasons. So we are at the lower level in terms of uh, operational activities, uh, but we, we are uh, pushing forward and implementing the mandates. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, General Dennis Gillespur um, and, and uh, Madame Leila Zaguri. Uh, I think the, the issues you highlighted has been very, very interesting and useful. The steps you've taken to, to protect the people where you are deployed, as well as your own peacekeepers, the support to you have provided and are providing to, to the governments where you are deployed. And of course, the, the degree to which you are continuing to focus on your essential operations, whether they are protection or supporting peace processes and so forth. I think these are very interesting to hear from those two peacekeeping operations. We also want to hear from uh, from uh, SRSG Mohamed Chambas, uh, that is the head of a special political mission who is dealing more with peace processes. And uh, uh, Mohamed, the question to you is, is, is to what degree has the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted your work in support of the various peace processes and transitions in the West Africa and the Sahel where you are operating? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's also a pleasure to participate in this forum. Um, you know, the, as a special political office, uh, the core mandate uh, relates to prevention. And uh, so mandate delivery uh, often involves frequent travels uh, in the region, interaction or face-to-face -face contact with regional institutions, uh, regional leaders, uh, political, leaders, opposition leaders, civil society leaders, and international partners and stakeholders. So with the current uh, pandemic, grounding travel, this has uh, greatly limited uh, our ability to be on the ground, to be on the spot, so to speak, and to be able to talk to, interact with all the stakeholders in particular contexts. Uh, however, uh, we have not uh, allowed this to uh, totally uh, deter us. We have adjusted, as all of us are doing, uh, particularly with use of uh, uh, technology, communications. Um, so, for instance, uh, I was able to participate in the first ECOWAS uh, Extraordinary Summit, which was by video conference and uh, use that platform, of course, to express the solidarity of the United Nations with regional leaders, uh, to send some messages from Secretary General, uh, who uh, is uh, with them, standing with them, along with all of UN, for instance, assuring them 
that the UN is staying to serve in the region, that uh, our country teams remain there, We're mobilizing uh, all uh, agencies, funds and programs to support national efforts and indeed also regional efforts in the fight against uh, COVID-19. Um, one other example is that, uh, for instance, in Benin, elections are being prepared for this Sunday, local and municipal elections. Very, very difficult uh, circumstances. Ordinarily, one would have been there before to speak to all the state institutions charged with conduct of elections to ensure that the arrangements are, are going on to ensure credible and a level playing field. Uh, of course, because of our inability to be there, we did arrange video conference uh, with uh, key authorities in Benin, uh, including with the electoral commissioner to understand what arrangements were being put in place, especially uh, what precautionary measures which would allow people to come out and vote without worsening the, or raising too high the risk of uh, further infections uh, by the COVID-19. And uh, through these exchanges, I think uh, uh, we got some assurances that uh, every effort is being put play in place to minimize risk. Uh, but I think the message also came across quite strongly the importance of uh, ensuring that um, safety of uh, citizens is, is protected. Uh, additionally, we have worked with uh, partners. Uh, in Dakar, we happen to have regional directors of most of the agencies. And so uh, through the crisis management team, at the regional level that has been set up, we are participating to see how do we pull our efforts together as UN. And then in some particular instances, I have been tasked to uh, contact leaders to facilitate certain regional initiatives. For instance, the UN was in the process or is in the process of setting up a, a hub, a logistics hub in Accra. Uh, and so through this, this forum of regional uh, crisis uh, team, uh, I took up the challenge to uh, contact regional leaders. And uh, I should say that so far we've had good cooperation and um, this process is on, ongoing. We hope that through that, UN will be able to uh, support with the delivery of uh, PPEs and other med medical material, um, uh, operationalize uh, the logistic hub in Accra, but importantly also ensure that staff that are needed on the ground, for example, in humanitarian uh, centers, in IDP camps, that these staff will be available, can be moved uh, to these locations to continue providing service. So, uh, we continue to adjust. I think it's important that we do. And um, as the crisis uh, continues to unfold, uh, we will see what we need to do to ensure that issues of conflict prevention uh, are not put uh, in the back burner. This year will be an election year in West Africa. Uh, so far, we've had one election that happened before the pandemic spread. But we have five key elections still coming up in Cote d'Ivoire, in Guinea, in Burkina Faso, in Niger, in Ghana. So uh, what do we do? Uh, I use the forum of the heads of state to draw attention that the COVID-19 dis uh, can disrupt and is probably already disrupting electoral calendars. However, there are important constitutional issues if elections are not held on time. Often we have seen that these kinds of situations can raise tensions, can, can provoke uh, conflict,
can trigger a crisis. So every effort needs to be made to facilitate consensus in redrawing electoral calendars if elections are not held on time. So I have been holding regular meetings with the RCs, particularly in the countries where elections will be held, trying to find out what can we do even under these circumstances. Uh, which stakeholders can we reach out to and already start sensitizing and pleading with all and encouraging all to avoid unilateral actions that can uh, trigger conflict, that can raise tensions, and to ensure that preparations uh, that are going on now are being done safely, but uh, also transparently, that uh, political leaders don't take undue advantage of the crisis uh, to uh, skew things in a manner that will prevent the creation of a level playing field and the creation of conditions for credible and peaceful elections. So these are some of the activities that we have been engaged on uh, in spite of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very good to hear about how uh, you are still able in, in, in uh, many ways to, to play a preventative role in your function, despite the, the COVID-19 disruptions. And I want to turn now to, to Rania Dagash in, in, in New York. Um, we've been uh, focusing on the different missions in the Congo, in Mali, and the West African region, but it'll be also interesting to hear how uh, the, the virus, uh, the pandemic, has affected the headquarters in New York. Uh, New York also one of the epicenters of, of the spread of the disease and have been affected heavily by the disease. And also, uh, once you've, you've uh, maybe reflected on the situation in New York, if you can also tell us from, from your perspective in New York, what do you see are the opportunities for the, for the call for a global ceasefire that the UN Secretary General is pursuing, Irania? Thank you, Cedric. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you here today, and thank you for convening us. Um, on on the, the New York uh, response, I think there were a lot of lessons that the United Nations learned from the Ebola response, uh, Cedric. And I think that um, in this response uh, to, to the COVID-19 crisis, we have come together as a system much better, both in terms of a a much more coordinated and rapid response to our uh, missions and, and uh, in the field, and also with regards to our own staff here in, in New York. Vis-a-vis um, -vis our missions, I think there has been a rally um, across the system, both from the humanitarian development side uh, on the socioeconomic impact of this crisis, on the humanitarian response and by WHO, and then from the Secretariat in response to support needed by our missions to make sure that we are all um, making sure that mandate implementation uh, is occurring uh, whilst our staff are safe, whilst at the same time we're able to support governments in their response. So it's been a, a very coherent task force that has been coordinating a lot of this and breaks down into different uh, segments about rotations of our troops, um, support uh, to mandate implementation groups and the more logistics and medical evacuations and CASIVAC support. So I think that's gone relatively well and it was up very fast. And in terms of our own staff, um, I think the Secretary General has been very proactive in working closely with the local government uh, in New York and making sure that we are telecommuting quite early and that we adhere to um, all the parameters that, the, that New York has set in place also. Um, and it has certainly demonstrated that a lot can be done telecommuting. So if we're lucky, this will be a pivot and a shift in how we do business um, and how we extend our support to our operations and to our member states um, and, and to our legislative bodies here as well. Um, on the ceasefire, Cedric, I think it's been um, a very noble call uh, for the ceasefire. We've seen um, an endorsement from 115 member states and coalitions of NGOs, religious leaders, 
Um, and that's and certainly some some of the armed groups as well have expressed nominal support, but unfortunately that has not translated into implementation um, on the ground or reduction in violence. So we are still working closely with our missions with Madame Leila and, and everyone else um, to make sure that we are advocating with parties to the conflict um, and that we are not just. Uh, facilitating the humanitarian access that this fire, the ceasefire was supposed to do, but also open space for diplomatic engagement and um, and channel their own energies into the prevention and mitigation of the spread of COVID. We've seen very uh, positive examples from from uh, Minusco as well as from. Um, MINUSCA and CAR, where the women groups have taken an extremely active role in engaging with parties to the conflict uh, to pass some of these messages, and we continue to support them. The other opportunity that I think this ceasefire uh, brings to the fore is, um, is highlighting that this is fundamentally a development crisis. It, at its heart, it's a health crisis, but it's a development crisis. And as, as uh, Mr. Shambas also said, it has also brought together our system better. If we were in a better place for our SDGs, I think this crisis would have been much better um, than where we are today. So I think there is definitely a big coherence and integration within the system that we're seeing that's going to bring peace operations and development actors in much closer contact as we, as we build back better, as the Deputy Secretary General says. Thank you so much. I mean, one of the things that I think uh, that your answer has uh, reminded me of as well, in a sense, is that this crisis is quite unique. Uh, typically, we face a crisis in, in one situation or in one country, but here we have a crisis that all the missions and, and all the situations where the United Nations is deployed or have a presence are facing the same crisis at the same time, including the headquarters in New York. And, uh, and are affecting, in many cases, developed countries more than developing countries at, at this stage in the Global South. So, so I think that is a, one of the features that make this crisis very unique. I'm going to turn next to, to uh, Lise Howard, who's been sitting very patiently, uh, uh, waiting to join the conversation. But before I do, I just want to uh, introduce the first of our two polls that we would like to ask our, our colleagues who are uh, joining us for this uh, for this discussion, and we want to ask you: uh, Do you think a United Nations peace operation should focus only on politics and security during this COVID nineteen crisis? Uh, so you have a yes or no option to answer to the poll, and uh, we'll come back to the results just now, and you may have an opportunity to to answer that poll in the meantime. So, Lise, what I wanted to ask you is you've just worked on this, you've just finished this book of yours on power and peacekeeping, um, and which you, where you focus specifically on, you know, how peacekeeping operations uh, exert influence. And I wanted to ask you, if you look at the way the peace operations have responded to COVID-19 and the priorities that they've identified, um, how does that uh, correlate with what you identified as, as the essential elements of how peacekeeping operations exert power and influence. Thank you so much, Cedric. Thanks for the opportunity and for that the nice plug of my new book. Um, thank you also to our hosts um, and to everybody listening and especially to our technical team. Um, yeah, I have a slightly different perspective because I'm sitting in the academy. So, um, I just I want to say one thing before I answer your question, which is I start the book by with us with a, an overview of the peacekeeping literature. And it's just to say that most multidimensional missions have protection of civilians as the main task of their mandates. And we now have 14 quantitative studies by research teams who don't know anything about peacekeeping. They just crunch numbers. It is unambiguous that the presence of UN peacekeepers means less death. It's, it's simply statistically uh, one of the most robust findings in international relations, that UN peacekeepers are saving lives. And the bigger the missions, the more lives they save. And that's controlling for everything you can imagine, where there are peacekeepers, where there aren't peacekeepers. So 
the news, even though if we read the headlines, the headlines are always doom and gloom. If you're working in a peacekeeping mission, it seems like things are, are very often dysfunctional. But if you step back for a moment and simply look across the board, um, this is a form of multilateral intervention that, that actually works. It, the first task of peacekeepers to save civilian lives, that is working. Now, my second point, which is unfortunately um, where we find ourselves today, is that peacekeeping is predicated on great power agreement. We don't have missions unless the P5 agree to, to launch them and field them and fund them and make sure that they function. Um, and this global ceasefire and the absence of signature by my one of my home countries, I have two of them, um, I find very unfortunate. And I will just say that sitting here in Washington, D.C., where I am right now, there are a lot of people who would like uh, this country to sign on to the global peace ceasefire. Um, and there is momentum building in town. We'll see where it goes. Um, and I'm also mindful of the time, so I'll say one last thing. The challenge of COVID um, and the economic downturn inspire fear. So whenever individuals have fear, like states, they turn inward. It's a, it's a common response to fear. But the problems that we're facing today, disease, climate change, refugee crisis because of these things, economic decline, rising international terrorism, the nature, the basic nature of the problems today require a multilateral lateral response. So even if we may go through a few years where peacekeeping is in decline, um, I don't know if you got to see Dan Smith yesterday, but he ended his segment by saying that cooperation is the new realism. And I think he's right. Realism is the idea that states tend to like to go it alone. It's much more complicated than that. But, um, but the fact of the matter is these problems can't be solved by one state alone. It's the nature of the problem. And so they, they, they require a cooperative solution. And as we've heard from all of our panelists today, the UN is adapting. It's, it, the system is integrating, according to Rania, right? We, we are figuring out collectively a way to respond to the nature of the problems. The nature of the problems won't be resolved by using force. Uh, that's kind of the punchline of my book, um, that peacekeeping is effective. Um, and its sources of effectiveness stem from the ability to listen to each other, to cooperate, to figure out ways to resolve problems um, uh, issuing the use of force. And that's all thank I'll you. say for now. Thank well, you. Thank you. That, that's, thank you so much. Let's see if we can get the result of the poll on, on the screen. Um, so 67% says that peacekeeping operations should not only focus on politics and security. Uh, people would like to see a broader engagement. That's a very interesting poll. Thank you for that feedback. And I'm also going to go now to some questions we've received from our, from our participants or audience. Um, the first one comes from uh, Gustavo de Carvalho. He's with the Institute for Security Studies. And I think this question I'm going to pose to, to Leila and Rania. And if both of you can try to be very short in your answer, because we would like to see if we can include maybe one or two more questions. Um, the question is basically that uh, peacekeeping operations have already been under financial pressure for a number of years. We are now probably or most likely going into a, a significant and severe global economic recession as a result of COVID-19. Uh, do you anticipate that uh, peacekeeping operations will be under further financial pressure? And how do you think that will affect, uh, Leila, to you, your mission, and, and Rania, to you, but perhaps more broadly, peacekeeping as, a, as an enterprise or an institution? So, Leila, if you can answer first. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that's, of course, one of the major uh, risks for the peacekeeping after this crisis, because we know that we will not have the large space because every country, as you mentioned, was affected. 
and uh, I'm sure that it will be very difficult to be generous uh, in the future, even if you consider that peacekeeping is relevant. So that's really the major, the major challenge, because if people challenge you because they think you are not relevant or they think there is another solution, that's another problem. That's a, a political choice. But now, if you will end up with the majority of state that used to be supportive, overwhelmed by their own crisis inside, that will be risk. And that's what I am really worried about. And that's what I'm trying to say to the Congolese here. You have to think about solution from inside because it will be more difficult to get the support from outside. And that's, I think, for us, we need really to focus on the priorities where we can make a difference. Because I briefed the fifth committee on our own budget, and I can see that there is a lot of question. Of course, member states, if they will decide to cut your budget, they will not say, I'm sorry, I have problem, that's why I'm doing it. They will certainly try to find argument to put the blame on you. So we have to be ready for that. And we have to prepare ourselves to identify where we cannot, where there is really a need for us to continue to pursue, because we have to think about the long term. And I like that, that uh, 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 we, we speak about, about the, the, the longer term process. And it's not through war that you can fix problems that are inside a country. Military means are a tool that put pressure, but the solution must come from inside. And the solution needs to go to the root causes. And you have to identify where there are the weakness. And our role is to help a government to see these kind of things and to put them on the table, to help them to take, to choose sometimes from difficult uh, solution and to help them to do that. So I think we have to prepare ourselves for reduction, for maybe cut that hopefully we, we, we hope not. No, we have to prepare for this and we have to also identify how a government that will be overwhelmed by a major economic and social. And we are working, for example, here in Congo, preparing on the nexus, working to push them. And we already are working to tell them you have to push agriculture, product from inside, help this to happen because you will not get the support from outside. I will stop here because I know that you asked me to not take the whole time, but I think this is a very important subject that we need to discuss further in the future. Thank you so much. And, and very interesting also that you reflect on the fact that uh, although uh, this may on the one hand put pressure on peace operations, perhaps one positive unintended consequences that it also emphasizes to the national actors that, you know, they, the ballers and their court, they, they really have to, to step up and, and play their role. Rania, what's your perspective from New York? Thanks very much, Cedric. Um, and thank you, Gustavo, for the question. I think, um, as Liz said, we have proved to be a valuable investment. And if we reflect back on the 2008 uh, financial crisis, interestingly, um, our resources in peacekeeping increased by about 1.3 billion between 2008 and 2010. And from 2010 onwards, we had to survive and adapt with definitely um, belt tightening measures, uh, shall we say. So the more I think we go towards the um, the greater protectionism and nationalism and, and the implications of that socially and politically, I think in many ways we become a viable option to address the, the turmoil um, as a result of this. So I don't think there is, at least, uh, at least to my mind, a big fear that uh, peacekeeping will disappear. I think we will adapt and we will stay. Um, but what I think we will definitely have to do better is a few things. We will have to adjust the way we work we will have to be a lot more evidence-based so that our impact is more demonstrable. We will have to have, um, I think, a, a, like I was saying, a much tighter engagement with our development uh, partners, 
and beyond the UN, um, and more seriously with, with host states, but also with the, with the Brenton Wood institutions, so that we can address some of these underlying issues. And for Mr. Shambas's sake, definitely structural prevention um, and development elements have to be integral to all our mediated uh, political processes as well. So I think it's going to be a much sharper way of working, I, I suspect, but I think we will definitely survive it and adapt. Excellent, thank you so much. I also have a, a audience question uh, from uh, Godwin Okoko for uh, Mohammed Chambas and, and Dennis Gillespur. And I ask you to please also respond uh, uh, just in a minute or two so that we still have time. We're in our last 10 minutes or so. And the question is, um, you know, during this COVID-19 time, uh, how is it still possible? How, what are you doing in order to engage with uh, local NGOs, uh, local communities, uh, other non-state actors? Um, are you, do you still find the space to reach out to, to those kind of actors in this context? Uh, perhaps, uh, Mohammed, if you can answer first. Yes, uh, we do. Um, we have, for instance, a network of uh, women uh, in peace in West Africa. Um, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, next week, we have established uh, what we're setting up, uh, a forum where we will, using a, a platform, be able to hear from them, uh, their respective uh, countries, work that they are still able to do under the circumstances, try to anticipate uh, some uh, challenges that may be there, particularly the role of women in the elections that I uh, talked about. Uh, in one or two of those elections, it was uh, expected that we would support the creation of a uh, women's situation room. So we will take up specific issues like that. Uh, there are also some regional civil society um, networks. Uh, the one app is, is one. Uh, the uh, the ECOWAS network of civil society is another, and um, in these times uh, we can still uh, keep our relations with them. And uh, I've been uh, thinking that after the uh, the forum of women, the next forum we should try to set up uh, will be a forum of youth, and it, you know to do that successfully, we will work closely with the ECOWAS with the Jason Sahel Secretariat and with the LCBC uh, Secretariat. Uh, these are three organizations that we're working very closely with, especially the two latter organizations uh, in the Sahel. Uh, so through them, we can uh, virtually uh, hold uh, consultations, a conference, a think tank with uh, civil society uh, and I think uh, it will be a good uh, step. Uh, we hope that a uh, few partners will even be able to join us uh, in that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, General Gillesford? Well, I think uh, there's no substitute for cooperation now, and we, we will continue, and we are continuing uh, working closely together with NGOs as well as the, as the local population. Uh, however, uh, the, the the way we do it is somewhat different and, and uh, when it comes to uh, uh, working with NGOs and, and other is, uh, organizations we have a, a, a well uh, established network uh, the communication as such uh, is done somewhat differently but the dialogue is still there and uh, against the backdrop of the the humanitarian situation uh, the food insecurity uh, this only uh, perpetuates the need uh, for doing things on the ground also. And uh, we are taking action now together with our, our uh, civilian colleagues uh, to ensure that we provide uh, humanitarian access uh, to some of those uh, uh, parts of, of uh, the country that are, are suffering the most. Uh, so we, we find new ways and uh, we continue to cooperate. Excellent. Thank you so much. We've got five minutes left. And in that, before we finish, I'm, I'm going to post another poll to our audience. The question is, uh, do you think COVID-19 will have a lasting effect on how United Nations peace operations are conducted? And while you are, whilst you answer that poll, I'm going to ask each of the panelists 
to answer one final question. I'm going to be like a TV presenter and tell you that you only have 30 seconds each. Uh, and the question comes from uh, Helen Combes, and she asks, how do you think this crisis will impact your work in the near term? Uh, what is your priorities? What is your most important priority that you have to focus on uh, in the next few months? So uh, 30 seconds east, uh, each, and let me start with SRSG Chambas. Uh, the immediate uh, priority, obviously, is uh, ensuring that staff morale is uh, high, staff welfare is, is good. But at the same time, uh, I'd like to continue to work closely with the regional organizations. I just mentioned uh, them, ECOWAS, J. Sengsa Health Secretariat, LCDC, so that we start looking at how we continue to be relevant in supporting the various uh, peace building efforts, uh, reform efforts, and the elections that are due later uh, this year. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. I'm going to go to, to uh, Lise next, and then to Dennis, and then to Rania, and then to Leila. So, Lise, how do you see uh, the yeah. effect on uh, the priority for peace operations, perhaps? I know. Well, <laughs> in the academy, we have no idea whether we're reopening in the fall. So we're just crossing our fingers and hoping at this point. Um, I think the inability to travel or the restrictions on travel are going to be significant for everybody, whether you're doing research research, or you're, you're hoping to be deployed in a peacekeeping operation or hoping to come home. <laughs> um, so that mental health um, issue SRSG is certainly one to be mindful of. Um, uh, for me, I think, and for both the Academy and for peacekeeping, it's good leadership is key. So figuring out how to make sure that we are electing good leaders, responsible leaders, leaders that listen and appointing leaders. Leadership makes all the difference, whether it's in, uh, in domestic politics or in a peacekeeping mission. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, General Dennis Gillespur. Well, I, I would uh, say uh, become more adaptive. Uh, we, we don't know uh, where this crisis will take us uh, and we need to continue to to exercise dynamic decision making and to, to factor in the, the COVID uh, situation and adapt accordingly. We have to change uh, work priorities and, and uh, also uh, how we in, uh, engage with others. Uh, and the other part is be to become more cohesive. This is this is the time for us to step forward, as uh, all uh, the international actors have uh, an important responsibility to, to support uh, the host country. And uh, uh, I see I see good signs. I see progress. Uh, we will continue come out of this stronger as a mission than we were uh, before this crisis. Thank you so much, uh, Rania. Thank you, Cedric. Um, I have four points. I think technology and innovation are going to be central to how our adaptation is going to move forward. So that is certainly something we will be exploring. Um, community engagement, I think, and social contracts and what those mean to our operations are going to be integral to our success as multidimensional uh, operations. I think we'll keep a very um, watchful eye on how the socioeconomic impacts of this crisis are going to impact the political processes and how we, we can respond to those uh, in a timely manner. And finally, we are already exploring the future of peacekeeping and what it should look like. So um, we will be seeking the views of many of you um, at this panel and many who are listening as we try and draw out some scenarios and a vision for what the future may hold for us. Excellent, thank you. Leila, 30 seconds, please. I think for me, first and foremost, the morale, keeping the morale of the troops, the team. Second is also to continue to have, to keep uh, the, uh, the government listening and having this contact because it's very, very important. You are speaking from outside. It's the technology work when you are in a headquarter, when you are uh, operating on the ground, you need to the face to face. You cannot influence uh, politically if you are not getting this contact. So keeping this contact, making sure that what you consider as important 
to not re relapse in conflict, to not end up in a major crisis uh, is an essential and keeping your team healthy and ready to continue to work while we are facing this blockade and, and uh, uh, the challenge that we are facing. Two priorities so for the next... Thank you very much. Let's get the answer of the poll up as I uh, close and say thank you very much. Uh, so we have 76% uh, that do think that uh, COVID-19 is going to have a lasting effect on, on UN peace operations. Uh, but I must say that I think we are, we are amazed about how remarkably you have uh, in the missions and and in, uh, in, in you know us and, and other special political missions, the, the remarkable way in which you have adapted uh, to this crisis. Uh, one of the positive side effects uh, that Dennis has also highlighted is the degree to which this uh, crisis has also led to, to more cooperation and cohesion between host governments and missions uh, within the UN family, within international actors. So very interesting also the positive side effects that have come out of this crisis. So thank you very much to, to the panel especially for joining us this afternoon, to all of you who have joined us on live stream or or otherwise during the audience. And of course, thank you very much also to uh, our hosting partners, CIPRI and, and the Stockholm Forum. Goodbye, everyone.